Tuck Everlasting, Chapter 20. When he was standing with her cheek pressed into Tuck's chest, her arms flung tight around him. She trembled and kept her eyes squeezed shut. She could feel Tuck's breath come and go in little gasps. It was very quiet. The tree gap constable knelt over the sprawled body of the man in the yellow suit, and then he said, He ain't dead, leastways not yet. When he opened her eyes a crack, she could see the shotgun lying on the grass where May had dropped it. She could see May's hands too, hanging limp, clenching, then hanging limp again. The sun was scorching hot and near her ear a gnat whined. The constable stood up. What did you hit him for? He wheezed resentfully. She, he was taking the child away, said May. Her voice was dull and exhausted. He was taking the child against her will. At this, the constable exploded. Dang, dang it, woman. What you trying to say? Taking that child against her will? That's what you done. You kidnapped that child. Winnie let go of Tuck's waist and turned around. Her trembling had stopped. They didn't kidnap me, she said. I came because I wanted to. Behind her, truck drew, Tuck drew his breath in sharply. You wanted to, echoed the constable, his eyes wide with disbelief. You wanted to? That's right, said Winnie, unflinchingly. They're my friends. The constable stared at her. He scratched his chin, eyebrows high, and eased his own shotgun to the ground. Then he shrugged and looked down at the man in the yellow suit who lay motionless on the grass, the blazing sun white on his face and hands. His eyes were closed now, but except for that, he looked more than ever like a marionette, a marionette flung carelessly to the, into a corner, arms and legs every which way, mitts tangled strings. The one glance she gave him fixed his appearance forever in Winnie's mind. She turned her eyes away quickly, looking to Tuck for relief. But Tuck was not looking back at her. Instead, he was gazing at the body on the ground, leaning forward slightly, his bras drawn down, his mouth a little open. It was as if he were entranced and, yes, envious, like a starving man looking through a window at a banquet. Winnie could not bear to see him like that. She reached out a hand and touched him, and it broke the spell. He blinked and took her hand, squeezing it. Well, anyway, said the constable at last, turning businesslike, I got to take charge here. Get this feller into the house before he fries. I'm telling you now, if he don't make it, you're in a pickle, you people. Now, here's what we'll do. You, he said, pointing at May. You got to come with me, you and the little girl. You got to be locked up right away, and the little girl, I got to get her home. The rest of you, you stay here and with him. Look after him. I'll get back with the doctor as quick as I can. Should have brought a deputy, but I didn't expect nothing like this to happen. Well, it's too late now. All right, let's get moving. Miles said softly, Ma, we'll get you out right away. Sure, Ma, said Jessie. Don't worry about me none, said May in the same exhausted voice. I'll make out. Make out, explained the constable. You people, beat all. If this feller dies, you'll get the gallows. That's what you'll get. And that's what, if that's what you mean by make out. Tuck's face crumpled. The gallows, he whispered, hanging. Hanging? That's it, said the constable. That's the law. Now let's get going. Miles and Jesse lifted the man in the yellow suit and carried him carefully into the house. But Tuck stood staring, and Winnie could guess what he was thinking. The constable swung her up onto his horse and directed May to her own saddle. But Winnie kept her eyes on Tuck. His face was very pale and creases deeper than ever, and his eyes looked blanked and sunken. She heard him whisper again, the gallows. And then Winnie said something she had never said before, but the words were words she had sometimes heard and often longed to hear. They sounded strange on her lips and made her sit up straighter. Mr. Tuck, she said, don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. The constable glanced heavenward and shook his head. Then clutching his shotgun, climbed up behind Winnie and turned the horse forward to the path. You first, he barked at May. I got to keep my eye on you. And as for you, he added grimly, speaking to Tuck, you better hope that feller don't die on you. I'll be back soon as I can. 
Everything will be all right, Tuck repeated slowly. Mays slumped on the back of the fat old horse, did not respond. But Winnie leaned round the constable and looked back at Tuck. You'll see, she said. And then she faced forward, sitting very straight. She was going home, but the thought of that was far from her mind. She watched the rump of the horse ahead, the swish of court, the swish of course, dusty hairs as he moved his tail, and she watched the swaying, sagging back of the woman who rode him. Up through the dim pine trees they went, the constable's breath wheezing in her ears and emerging from the coolness of the green. When he saw again the wide world spread before her, shimmering with light and possibility, but the possibilities were different now. They did not point to what might happen to her but to what she herself might keep from happening. For the only thing she could think of was the clear and terrible necessity. May Tuck must never go to the gallows. Whatever happened to the man in the yellow suit, May must not be hanged. Because if they had said was, if all they said was true, then May, even if she were the cruelest of murderers and deserved to be put to death, May Tuck would not be able to die.